Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast, where I look to distill the best practices and best ideas of the world's most successful families and their family offices. I hope to provide thought-provoking opinions and feature amazing thought leaders to our listeners of the podcast with an eye towards the future of the family office. Today's podcast is titled David Sinclair, A Discussion on Longevity, COVID-19, and Biotech. We're very, very fortunate to have David on. I've been a big fan for a long time, not just from his wonderful books and his great podcast with uh, heroes to podcasters like me, like Joe Rogan, Uh, but let me give you an idea of David's background. Again, if I read his full bio, we'll probably be here for 15 minutes. It's incredibly distinguished. I'm going to pick out a couple of highlights, then we'll get right to the interview. David A. Sinclair, PhD, is a professor in the Department of Genetics and co-director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for the Biology of Aging at Harvard Medical School. He is best known for his work on understanding why we age and how to slow its effects. David Sinclair is the co-founder of several biotech companies. He is also the co-founder and co-chief editor of the Journal of Aging, His work is featured in five books, two documentary movies, 60 Minutes, and Morgan Freeman's Through the Wormhole. Several years back, Time Magazine, in their list of 100 most influential people in the world, named David Sinclair. David, welcome to the show. Angelo, thanks. It's great to be here. Thank you. We have a lot to cover today in relatively a limited window. Uh, I wish I had the two hour plus that uh, Joe has, so I'm going to have to work this a little bit quicker than I would like. Uh, Many of my audience knows that I'm a little bit fanatical about health and wellness. So some people would say, Angelo, you're a family office organization, investment taxes, operation structures, philanthropy. You know, what are you doing? Well, it's COVID-19 that time. So health is very applicable. And sometimes the one thing that money really can't buy no matter, you could be worth $100 billion, but you would give that all away if you had, what, a terminal case of cancer or something horrific. So your health and your ability to enjoy your relationship with your family, your community, your loved ones is really something that money might enhance opportunities medically and with other uh, potential value and benefits. But again, uh, it's a something that many of the wealthiest people in the world would give up to have their their health, and that's how important it is. Uh, In terms of your book, Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To, uh, you know, David, why don't I start with that? Why do we age? Well, we've always aged since life first began, actually. Um, This is what life does. It doesn't last forever. But life doesn't have to be short. Um, We are living things. We can take in energy. We, We eat. We these days we have more food than, than we could ever consume. Um, and what we do with that energy is we preserve the body. And what we've discovered in my lab and others around the world, and I've been doing this now for over 25 years, have my own lab at Harvard for 20, is trying to find what it is about the body that slows the aging process down. Because we, we know that some people live in a healthy way in their 90s and even beyond that, and others become sick in their 70s. And what is it that makes the difference between those people? And we actually have discovered that most of it is not genetic. It's what we call epigenetic. And so in my book, I put forward, um, and in my research, of course, put forward the idea that aging isn't just an accumulation of damage, which is the way we used to think about it in the 20th century, but it's, it's a loss of information. And it, it's similar to actually the internet in that if you send out a signal or a radio signal, it will have a loss of information. It can get corrupted, it gets noisy. But what's tricky about the the internet, the reason the internet works better than a radio signal, and certainly better than than old fashioned types. Oh, they are someone on that has their turn on mute everyone, unless it's me and David. If you could be muted everyone. I am muting everyone, and David, could you hear me? Yes, we're good. Okay, I unmuted you, or you unmuted yourself, perfect. If you don't mind, continue. Yeah. 
Uh, so what it boils down to, I think, is that aging is simply a loss of information, information that we get from our parents, but over time we lose that. And there are certain types of information in the body that we have. Of course, there's the genes that we inherit, but there's this other type of information called the epigenome, which I think is key to understanding why we age. And it, you know, we, do we age to some degree because our DNA gets modified? Uh, sunlight, living, uh, there's so many different factors. I guess our cells lose the ability to read the way they used to. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, but it, it's not the old way of thinking about it, which is what you'll hear it, you know, over the water cooler at parties. The old idea is that our DNA just gets mutated, that you go in the sun, you get DNA damage, and that's it. But there's a much, I think, much more important aspect to this. What's going on is that a lot of the information in our bodies is still there when we're old um, that would allow us to be young again. It's just that our bodies don't read that genetic information correctly. Um, I use the analogy a lot of a, a DVD. A DVD will be read perfectly, uh, but if you use it a lot, it gets scratched. Um, it's similar in our bodies. The information is still there genetically. We can clone cells, we can clone animals. So the information to be young is still there. It's just that our cells lose the ability to read that information. And that's the epigenome, the epigenetic information that I'm talking about. And that's my big idea in the book and what we can talk about today. Because if that's true, there might be a backup copy of that information that we could access. So it'd be similar to uh, the way the internet works. We, we can go back and retrieve an email if it didn't make it. Or in the case of the DVD, we could polish the DVD and get the ability to read it again. Um, or in the case of a computer, think of it as a, a, re, a reboot and reinstall new software so the computer works again. That's what I think we're talking about here for aging now. And in your book and your work, you write and talk about serotuins. If you could explain what that is to the audience and how it interplays with all of this, very importantly. Yeah, so the, the sirtuins, let, let's just go back to the DVD analogy because it's helpful. The sirtuins are what stop the scratches from occurring. They maintain a, a nice shiny disc. Um, we can talk about what that actually means in biology. But essentially, the, these are enzymes that protect the body. They move around in different parts of the cell. They fix things that are broken. And they keep the genes on that should stay on and keep the genes that are off, off. And what we don't think about often is, why is a nerve cell a nerve cell and a skin cell a skin cell? It's in part these sirtuin genes and their co-workers that maintain cellular identity. And in an old person, the cells are losing their identity and these sirtuins haven't, have lost their ability to keep the cell young. But the good news is there are ways to keep them more active, slow that process down, um, and as I hope we'll get to later, perhaps reboot the whole system and get the sirtuins to go back to how they worked when we were young. That would be amazing. I have a lot of questions about that in ways that, again, we could enhance that uh, through lifestyle uh, through potentially biotech and certainly potentially through supplementation. Right before I get to that, those that are watching in on YouTube and or listening in in the future in a podcast, this is a live recording. So we do have a significant live audience listening in. That does mean there could be some more background noises than are normal historically in my podcast and videos, but it does add an element of value to the those listening in live as my members as well as their ability to send in a chat feature and interact with our special guest. But if the uh, sound or video is a pinch off or is a little background noise, my apologies in advance. Uh, back to serotuins and really tying some of this together, there is one, I'm going to call it a compound, a supplement that you do talk about uh, that I think most of our audience has heard about and they probably perceive it to be, well, this is the benefit of red wine, isn't it? And that's resveratrol, if you could talk a little bit about that. Right, so a little bit more about sirtuins. These are enzymes that you can find in plants, in humans, of course, we have seven of them in different uh, roles. Uh, and in yeast, where we first worked on them and showed that they could extend the lifespan and health of these little fungi, uh, we actually found that they are able to keep those cells much younger. Now, we can't just genetically modify ourselves easily. We wouldn't want to. 
But what we did in the early 2000s in my lab um, at Harvard Medical School was to find, are there any molecules out there, whether they're drugs or supplements, uh, that could activate these protective sirtuins and in that way keep us younger for longer and even reverse some aspects of aging. And so actually uh, we teamed up with some other labs um, and we found that there was a molecule, uh, well, one of, one of about 20 that was able to activate these sirtuin enzymes. So the enzymes, um, I don't, don't know if everyone remembers their high school biology, but an enzyme, you can think of it like a Pac-Man. Um, if you're old enough, you'll know what a Pac-Man is. Um, a Pac-Man, the enzymes are normally doing this and, and doing activities in the cell, changing things. What we're looking for is, is a molecule that would stick to the Pac-Man, the sirtuin, and make it go really quickly. And that would be the equivalent of putting in extra copies of the gene, which we knew in yeast, and we now know in mice makes them healthier and live longer. So the best one at the time in 2003 that we published was resveratrol. And when I Googled resveratrol in the early days of Google, um, I discovered resveratrol was part of a uh, component of red wine. So I almost fell off my chair at that point. We were not studying red wine. We still don't study red wine, although I drink more than I used to. But it gave us a couple of <laughs> hints. It said that we could make potentially much better molecules. And in fact, we have molecules that are a thousand times better than resveratrol now that have been in human clinical trials that have shown signs of working uh, in the disease psoriasis, inflammatory skin disease. Um, and also we've, we've also figured out, we think that the plant world is making these what we call xenohermetic molecules, which is a fancy word for basically saying plants need sirtuin activators like resveratrol. And when we eat those plants that are stressed out and worried about dying, then we get the benefits too. And our enzymes, they sense the plant world. So a little bit, unfortunately, are you saying, and we'll get to things more advanced than resveratrol, but it's a good foundation, that the perception of drinking one or two glasses of red wine or eating red grapes, that's just probably going to give you a very, very tiny number. How do you potentially get more of something like resveratrol through supplementation? Right. Well, I have to be careful because I'm, I'm a scientist at Harvard Medical School um, and they, you know, they, they have certain standards. And so I'm not an MD and I, I don't endorse supplements and I certainly don't mention companies for good reason, right? Um, companies have used my name to sell products without my permission. So I'll tell you as much as I can um, right now. Um, so you can supplement with pure resveratrol. Uh, look for what's called GMP grade, which is good manufacturing practices, procedures. That means that it's done in, in good conditions in the, in the laboratory and in the factory. Um, I take a, a little teaspoonful in my yogurt. What's not, not well known about resveratrol is if you just swallow a pill, a dry powder, it should be white by the way, if it's brown, throw it away. Um, if it's light gray, it's fine. If you just swallow it, it doesn't dissolve. It's, it's like eating brick dust. It's that insoluble. So you, generally, if it's taken with a bit of olive oil or butter or something oily or a yogurt, uh, it dissolves well. And there have now been clinical trials showing that about a gram or two is what's needed to be able to bring down blood sugar levels and repeat the kind of things we saw in, in those mice back uh, in the 2000s. But you're right about this, that drinking red wine is unlikely to cure diabetes. Of course, no one would believe that. But I, I do believe though, that if you drink red wine over, you know, not in excess, maybe one or two glasses at most a day, that you will have long-term benefits. Because there's not just resveratrol, there's of course a bit of alcohol, there's other plant polyphenols as they're called. And if you do that over many, many years, um, and they do tend to accumulate in your body, uh, you might have long-term benefits as well. So that's another reason why I prefer red wine over white. Uh, another important compound supplement that really plays into this and on the health circuit is very well known. Uh, asking me to pronounce it, it's asking for trouble, but let's go for it. Nicotinamide, rabidoside, NR is what we call it, <laughs> a slayman. And NMN, and really how this interacts with something called NAD. I know I'm throwing a lot of acronyms out there. You probably have to clean that up. Uh, but why could this be an intriguing supplement potentially for people to take? Right. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm working, uh, and I, in full disclosure, I've started a couple of companies that are working on turning what are called NAD boosters as a collective group 
uh, into drugs. Uh, and so I was just on a call this morning, actually the, the past two weeks, I've been a lot of calls with hospitals who are uh, trying uh, NMN actually for COVID-19 patients, which we'll get to later. The way this all works is that NAD is a, an essential molecule for life. If we didn't have it, we'd all be dead in 30 seconds or less. It's like taking cyanide. NAD is vital for life. Many, actually hundreds of chemical reactions in the body require it. But what we also discovered in studying the sirtuins, um, and I want to give credit to my, my former mentor at MIT where I trained, Lenny Garenti, he co-discovered that the sirtuins, the enzymes, the Pac-Man, mm -hmm. uh, Pac-Women, you want to call them, um, they actually, so remember I said resveratrol makes them do this? Well, without NAD, the enzyme is stuck like this. It will not work. So think of resveratrol and the polyphenols from plants as the accelerator pedal, and the NAD is the gas. And without the gas, it doesn't matter what you do. And the problem is that certainly in mice, and it looks like in people too, many of our tissues, um, and certainly our skin, we have less NAD as we get older. And that means our sirtuin defenses, which are cleaning up cells and preventing the scratches on our genome, they work less. Um, and particularly with COVID-19 patients, it's been shown um, in early work that they have very low NAD levels as well once they have the infection. In fact, the virus chews up the NAD. So what we're talking about is restoring the NAD levels back to a youthful level and allowing our bodies to defend themselves and heal the way we did when we were young. Uh, in the health circles, you hear a lot about longevity and tying in something called telomere or telomere length. If you could explain to our audience what that is and if you think that is a viable marker in terms of uh, being objective and looking at longevity. Um, yeah, it, it was one of the early markers of aging that we had, besides just looking in the mirror. Um, and so telomeres, just to remind everyone, is oh, the, the, the aglets, the ends of the chromosome, the aglet like a, the end of a, a shoe, um, shoelace. And as we get older, you can see that those telomere ends of our chromosomes get shorter and shorter. Uh, and if you cause that to happen very quickly in a mouse, it will get old looking. Now that's part of the story. It's certainly not the whole story because not all of our cells divide and lose their telomeres, but we still get old. We get old brains as well. But it is part of my overall information theory of aging in that loss of these ends does contribute. But also what we're finding is they have a dual role, is that they don't just lose the genetic material, the DNA, but the proteins that sit on the ends, including the sirtuins, by the way, they're at the ends in yeast and in human cells. When the, the ends get short, then these proteins go off and do things that they shouldn't do as these ends get shorter. So really the, the telomeres, you won't have long telomeres because they actually are part of this slowing down of the scratching process. So if you can lengthen them, it would be a good thing as long as it's safe. Now, one of the drawbacks, potential drawbacks that people have talked a lot about is that cancer cells like to have long telomeres because they, they like to grow. Um, and telomeres are thought to slow cancer cells from multiplying. That's theoretical. And actually, the more studies that have been done, the less that seems to be the case. So I'm, I'm less concerned about the safety issue. I'm just more focused on things that address not just the telomeres, but all the various causes of aging, of which there are, are at least eight that we need to address. And if we only address one at a time, we're not going to have the big gains that I'm hopeful we will. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear, and I have a whole bunch more questions, so we do want to be mindful of time, but you did get my attention there with eight key factors that we need to, is this something that we could summarize in two or three minutes to help lay the foundation for upcoming questions I have? For sure. So these are called the hallmarks of aging. And really what happened in the late 2000s was that the field uh, was all chaotic. People said, this is the cause of aging, this is the cause of aging. And we decided, okay, we'll draw a pie chart, we'll list all eight, and we'll all agree that that's it. And that's been the roadmap. Um, and so I'll list some of them. Um, so loss of telomere, as you mentioned, uh, misfolded proteins build up, causing Alzheimer's, for example, loss of stem cells, uh, senescent cells. So old cells um, become hyperinflammatory and sit there and cause havoc like zombies, call them zombie cells. Um, 
DNA damage is part of that. Loss of mitochondria, which are the, mm -hmm. the power packs of the cell. So these are the, 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 the eight. But as I write in my book, that doesn't sit well with me. This is like saying, um, we figured out why the earth goes around the sun because there's a thousand things happening. No, you can probably distill this down into an equation. You always want to simplify things. So I've been looking for the upstream cause of all of those hallmarks. Um, and this is my theory about information loss, that the information loss causes all of those other things to happen. Uh, it's a theory, but uh, it's gaining traction in the scientific world. Well, ironically, my next question was on a word that those interested in health have heard so much about, inflammation, exactly that. Uh, we hear that inflammation is bad. I guess that sounds relatively obvious and makes sense. Is it genetic? What can we do if it is bad, and I'm assuming it is, to lower inflammation in the body? Well, it, it's a very complicated system. And when you talk about inflammation, you have to talk about the various types because some are very good for us and some are very bad for us. And in the case of COVID-19, let's use that as an example. Um, as we get older, what we end up having, having is what's called inflammaging, which is chronic inflammation. So cells are, the body's designed to fight infections, but sometimes these, these mechanisms get turned on too much for too long. And that's called chronic inflammation. Now that's, that's an issue if you end up putting an infection on top of that because the body can overreact. And that's what we're finding with this so-called cytokine storm is that the elderly flip into that mode where they actually overdo it and end up attacking their own body rather than just the virus. But we do need inflammation, of course, otherwise we'd all die immediately from COVID-19. So it's a balance. You want to have an acute phase where you can attack the virus and kill the cells that get infected. But once the virus goes away, then you've got to turn it off. Otherwise you're going to have all the issues. And that's the biggest problem with the elderly right now. I'm going to segue a little bit and keep it on the theme of longevity. An obvious could detract or could enhance is simply how we eat, the food that we take in. Uh, there's so many different type of trendy diets and anyone who's a little bit in the health circles, vegan, uh, Rising now is nose to tail meat based diets, which probably like Ben Greenfield, Joe Rogan are probably more focused on paleo, keto. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that's probably the most important question you'll ask me today. Uh, so before I tell you that, and I will, is to, to understand first of all, I'm, I'm totally based on science, I have no agenda, I don't sell anything. So what I tell you is based on reading over 10,000 scientific papers on this and my own research. Um, what we have discovered is that when the body is perceiving threats to survival, it'll turn on the body's defenses. Now I've mentioned the sirtuin genes, but there are, other, uh, there are other genes they work with. There's one called mTOR, which senses amino acid consumption. And you, the lower amino acids you have in general, the better protection you have through this mTOR. There's another one called AMP kinase, sometimes called capital AMPK, which revs up metabolism. It's responsible for preventing diabetes and high blood, glu blood glucose levels. So that's, that's, the, that's the system that we work in. It's called the longevity network, or I call it the survival network. Okay, with all of that, what are the ways to trigger this? Now we've known for 70, close to 80 years now, that if you have few, fewer calories, you actually trigger this survival network. Um, same with exercise. Uh, now we believe same with heat and same with cold. You're turning on the survival network to keep your body young. And in some cases, reverse aspects of aging, such as endurance, which we can actually see in the lab with mice. So what do I do, uh, Angela, you asked me. Um, so it's all written on page 304 of my book. If you, know, <laughs> if you wanna go see that, that's the cheat sheet. Uh, but basically what I try to do is I eat less often per day. I'm not talking about malnutrition or starvation, of course not. Uh, I make sure that I'm not deficient in anything. And we'll talk about blood testing in a minute, I believe. But the, the point is that if you're always satisfied, sati satiated, then your body's not going to go into that defensive state. Your sirtuins are going to get lazy. 
your NAD levels are going to decline. Um, same for exercise and same for always being in a perfect temperature. So I, I take, so I eat less, I, I skip breakfast, I try to skip lunch, though it's difficult, especially if you're at home with food in the fridge. Um, I drink hot water and tea and this kind of thing to try and keep myself occupied and satisfied. That, that works for me, so it's intermittent fasting. Some people go for three days or five days. I, I've not been able to do that, but I think that that could be beneficial if you don't do it too often, maybe once every month or every quarter, do that. Um, I do try to exercise a lot. Now, I, I hate exercise, I, I'll admit. I'll go to the gym, I exercise three, four times a week now that I'm at home. Um, and so building up my muscle capacity is good. It means I can eat a little bit more as well. Um, I try to do aerobics as well, go for walks if, if nothing else. So there's that, that's the baseline. I do try to take cold showers occasionally, though that's painful. I prefer to go to the gym and just jump in a cold pool. Um, and I do saunas at least once a week because there's more and more evidence that that also triggers these defenses. Now talk about protein. Now the type of food that you eat is also important. Remember 80% of how you'll live in late life is in your own hands. It's non-genetic, non-inherited. Um, so kind of the kind of food that I eat is it tends to be very fresh because I want those xenohermetic natural molecules from the plant world. I try to, try to choose plants that have color or that have been grown under conditions that are not perfect. So if you, if you like to buy those iceberg lettuces that are white and watery, I would discourage you. I would say try to get organic, try to get foods that have color. The color isn't necessarily the, the, good, the good part of it. It's that the molecules that come along with colored plants are, are really good for you, like resveratrol, for example. Uh, so you're, I'm assuming, going to lean personally more to a vegan type diet. There are some, uh, Dr. Gundry and others, that will say that plants have self-defense mechanisms, that people could get very sensitive to it, uh, that there could be issues relative to inflammation with lectins. How would you answer that? Or is everyone simply different? Well, yeah, it, it gets annoying when you say everybody's different. It, it is true that some diets will work for others, but you, you can generalize. The general theme is that uh, if you always eat meat, you're going to turn off your mTOR defenses, which in the long run, I don't believe is going to be helpful. In the short run, sure. I mean, you build up muscle. It's good to go to the gym. You get all of that benefit. You'll lose weight. And, you know, the, the people, you know, Joe's great. Um, ben Greenfield's great. But I think if you, if you want to extend your lifespan and still be healthy in your 90s, that's not the perfect diet. Um, but can you do something that includes meat? Absolutely. I'm not vegan. I'll eat meat a few times a week. Not a lot, of course, um, especially if I've just worked out at the gym. Um, and it's all about moderation, really. I think the key is that you don't want to overdo anything. Um, I, I look at also scientifically what diets extend lifespan. And I think the, the blue zones, Dan Butner, it's a great way to go. You look for places that prove out what works. So the kind of foods you want to eat are olive oil, the red wines, the, the green leafy vegetables. Um, you can have a bit of meat. The Okinawans who live the longest in the world, they have fish. They don't avoid protein, but they don't eat a lot of it. They'll actually finish a meal at about 70% uh, fullness. Um, so that, those are the, the rules I, I try to live by. It's not easy. I'm not perfect. I'll occasionally eat a bag of chips. I feel bad about that. But, you know, in general, you do what you can. Um, and, you know, you can take supplements as well that we think will mimic the benefits of diet and exercise by turning on these defenses as well. Uh, since you mentioned blue zones, Okinawa, Loma Linda, uh, Sardinia, I believe, in Italy and a couple of others, it's not like those people living to age 100 were formally practicing a cardio plan, lifting weights. Uh, it, they, what is among the determining factors as to why they have more people that live to be age 100? Is it stress reduction? Is it slow walking over miles and miles every day without being too impactful to the body? What is it? It is the combination. Uh, there's no one thing you can do to live to 100 that I know of. And you're right, a lot of the people who live that long, um, they didn't live perfect lives. Sometimes you know, they, they smoke for a lot of their, their lives. But to give us all the best chance 
of reaching those ages, you do need to do the combination. And actually, it's not that difficult. Um, at least it's technically not that complicated. There was a study that came out of Harvard Medical School recently by another group that showed that if you just do the five common things that we all know are good for us, uh, don't smoke, don't eat too much, don't become obese, uh, what is it, have a social network, get good sleep, um, eat the right foods, eat mostly plant-based, you can actually extend your lifespan just by doing those things by 14 years. And that's just the beginning. What wow. we're talking about now is going another level of science and doing those to a perfect level based on what we know. But yeah, I mean, th these things are combinations of things and, and getting to the, the blue zones, it's generally, um, it's moving a lot, doesn't have to be running, can be walking. So people who walk dogs tend to live longer, uh, but I don't think it hurts to do aerobic exercise. High, in, high intensity impact training is very good to get your uh, blood flow going. Um, but they tend to have also good networks. They're, they have a lot of joy in their lives. They have humor. Their level of stress is low as well. And all of these things combine to give the best chance. Uh, I would like to have spent more time on the exercise component and even diet-wise with keto, but we're we are going to have to keep things moving because we also do want to cover things relative to COVID-19. That could be something for a future podcast. But there was something that you mentioned, which is at the top of the food chain now in the health circles that I think needs a little bit more coverage. And that is from cold plunge pools uh, to saunas. We look at it as a relaxer, uh, a stimulator with the cold. But besides that, it appears to have legitimate you know, all cause mortality benefits. Now, before someone jumps in a cold plunge pool, you should get a medical doctor, make sure your heart's okay. But if you could give a little bit more detail on the extremes of cold plunge and sauna and why it's beneficial. Yeah, uh, well put. Yeah, you, you need to make sure whenever you do something to your body that, that you know what you're doing and, and your doctor knows about it very clearly, you know, that, that you can overdo anything. And let's talk about monitoring in a minute. But yeah, when I started writing my book, the editor said, can you talk about this cryotherapy? And I said, can I, come on, I'm, I'm a scientist. I don't want to go into those fads. But I looked into it and the science uh, actually does look promising for both saunas and cold plungers. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. Oh, um, the, um, but don't, I've got my mask here if anyone's <laughs> Uh, so yeah okay so let's think about um, talk about saunas first so saunas have been around since before the Roman times so you know sometimes the ancients knew what they were doing mostly in Scandinavia uh, they've studied particularly businessmen um, it just happens that's what's in the literature but uh, men are predisposed to heart disease right and, and um, heart attacks these people generally if they have sauna bathing as they call it more than once a week have dramatic reduction sometimes 30 40 percent in the risk of having a heart attack which i thought was really really interesting now there's some caveats such as if people are in a wheelchair or you know even worse if they're in the hospital they're less likely to go to the sauna right but i think that the science bears this out cold plunges a lot of data that these sirtuins that i talked about are activated by the cold and what happens is you get more brown fat in your body um, on the on the back of the shoulder blades, you can have what's called browning of the fat, and that's very healthy fat. It revs up metabolism, and they, these cells secrete factors that seem to be good for health. So both of those combinations, we think, are activating the body's defenses against aging because it's telling the body, whoa, I'm under threat, I could die, not a good time to relax, let's fight against this uh, onslaught. And long-term, that we think gives us longevity. This may weave into the immunity issue with COVID-19, but I did skip over. We covered a little bit resveratrol, NAD, but generally in terms of the research, the scientific research on supplementation that effectively everyone could take, uh, besides those two, potentially, again, see your medical doctor, uh, what are other supplements that potentially could enhance the benefits of living longer and healthier? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one is uh, called metformin, which currently, in at least in the US and Europe and Australia, needs a prescription. 
Um, so the reason I bring it up is that a lot of people have taken metformin, millions of people, for type 2 diabetes. It's, as I mentioned, good at bringing blood sugar down by activating this AMP kinase component of longevity. We know that if you give it to mice, they tend to live longer and are healthier. If you look at tens of thousands of people who have taken metformin, these are diabetics, type 2 diabetics. They actually have protection against other diseases, it seems. Diseases like cancer, uh, diseases like Alzheimer's, diseases, oh, well, frailty. And what that tells me is that it's possible that metformin is a longevity drug. Now, it's not proven. It's a very long experiment, very expensive clinical trial. But, you know, if we all wait for the proof, uh, most of us listening will probably be too old for us to, to do anything about. So you do have to push the boundaries a little bit, but again, do it under doctor's supervision. Now, it's not risk-free. There can be some side effects. The main one is stomach discomfort. I have to take my metformin uh, with some food or some milk. Um, and there can be some serious side effects such as uh, what's called lactic acidosis. So it's not risk-free um, and you wanna certainly look at the literature. Um, I'm not trying to plug my book here, but there, I did write about this a lot and there are a lot of references in my book if you wanna read those and even discuss those with your doctors. And how about aspirin? I take an aspirin, um, uh, you know, it's gone back and forth. People say it doesn't work, it does. But if I look at the whole body of evidence, um, 83 milligrams a day is unlikely to hurt um, and I think can have a lot of benefit long-term. Um, it's not gonna totally in one day fix heart disease, but I think chronic dosing will prevent inflammation of the cardiovascular system, which is something that I think everyone would, would agree is a good thing and a much more controversial drug, rapamycin. Yeah, so rapamycin, um, some of you probably know about this. It's an, an anti-rejection drug, but it's also, it turns on the defenses through mTOR. Remember, mTOR is the sensing of amino acids. So if you eat meat all the time, you're not gonna get the benefits. Rapamycin will actually give you those benefits, we think. If it's actually the, the drug that extends lifespan most rigorously um, and most extensively in animals. Um, and it works for mice and all sorts of animals. Um, and there's a test on dogs right now. Rapamycin though is controversial because it's an immunosuppressant and it has, can, has some serious side effects at, at the doses that are used in patients for transplant rejection. So 10 milligrams and higher toxic, can be toxic to the liver, liver and particularly the, the kidneys. So, you know, if you, if you wipe out your kidneys, you're not going to live longer. But the question is, if you have microdosing or intermittent dosing, maybe that could be helpful. And that's, of course, something that you absolutely want to discuss with a doctor. Um, I don't myself do that. I prefer to, on certain days, restrict meat. Um, I did try it once. Um, I, I caught a cold for the first time in years. And so, you know, I was, I'm a little bit wary of it. But I think the science behind it is really strong. And the importance in scientific literature of sleep, quality of sleep, has that been proven to enhance longevity? Not that I'm aware, but it's very important um, in general for health, more than you might think. Actually, the, the NAD levels that, that I was talking about, they cycle through the day. And so your sirtuins get activated and they, they, then they go down and then they get activated. And this is part of the clock that determines when we feel tired. And studies in mice at least indicate if you fly across the planet, the reason you'll have jet lag is because your NAD cycles will be out of sync. So what I'm trying to say is that if you have good sleep, your body will defend itself against aging, um, but vice versa. If you activate your longevity pathways, you'll actually have, we think, have better sleep because they're so intimately connected. And I didn't notice it on your hand, but I didn't give a close look. By chance, do you own an aura ring? Uh, I do. <laughs> I do. There um, it is. <laughs> yeah. So no I, connection to the company. I really do love it, though. Um, you, I mean, you can't fix what you don't measure. So I, I'm in favor of a lot of data. Yeah, the aura ring for those listening in and look it up. It's very popular in health circles and really among the main things that it does is it gives you measurables and metrics. And yes, that's what it looks like. 
I lost my charger. Uh, so I need to find a charger, but it, it tells you the quality of your deep sleep, which could be a very important factor broadly to your health. That probably is the main metric, but it certainly does others. Uh, you know, I've, it, and it varies among people I listen to, but there are people that say, hey, you know, you may benefit from getting 10 minutes of sunlight every day, not just vitamin D, but just in general for multiple reasons, but you have a more conservative approach that actually this could be a grave negative towards longevity. If you could give a little bit of color on that, please. Sure, well, so with the information theory of aging, the scratches on the DVD, uh, one of the main drivers of that process uh, is DNA damage, uh, in particular broken chromosomes or broken DNA molecules. Um, in the lab, if we create a mouse, which we have, that has these broken DNAs, um, they actually get accelerated aging. Um, so I'm, I'm all about trying to mim minimize DNA damage and going out in the sun, you know, for a little bit with sunscreen is not gonna hurt you. In fact, it's probably beneficial but you know the old days i'm from australia originally of sun baking uh, it's really going to age you there's no question you won't just look older you literally your skin will be older so i would prefer people and myself included i i take vitamin d instead we're all probably deficient in winter unless we supplement so i i take at least two and a half thousand uh units a day i use some people go as high as ten thousand i'm not sure if that's safe or proven safe at least but yeah, vitamin D is very important for health and longevity in the long run, and also in, in improving your immunity against viruses. Yes, actually, that was one of the subject points of the COVID-19 part, which will probably come up in about three or four more minutes. Uh, green tea, has that been proven to enhance anything with longevity? Yes, uh, actually. So green tea has um, ECGC, which is, again, one of these xenohormetic molecules. Uh, let me just explain quickly what those words mean before I talk about green tea. So hormesis is this idea that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, puts your body in that heightened state. So exercise, skipping meals, that's hormesis in action. And xenohormetic molecules uh, is the idea that, that we came up with, is that the plants will stimulate that. And xeno just means from other plants. So green tea has it, coffee has xenohormetic molecules, of course, red wine. These are the things you want to eat. So green tea actually is very good for you. I try to drink green tea, but not too late because there's caffeine in it. And it actually targets the pathways that are anti-inflammatory, which as we spoke about with aging are very important to dampen. Otherwise you get diseases of aging if your immune system gets overactivated. I think I might've glanced over a little too quickly about 10 minutes ago and maybe just a little bit more context. Uh, the value from a longevity and health perspective, one of the things that goes back, I think, decades and decades and decades in research is caloric restriction. Uh, and how that maybe interplays with the incredibly trendy intermittent fasting. For those that don't know, that basically means you eat within a limited window and you're not taking in anything other than perhaps black coffee, perhaps tea, even that's debatable, for a 16-hour period. So basically, if you eat dinner and wrap up at seven o'clock at night, it usually just means not eating anything in between, skipping breakfast, and then you're good to go over lunch. But this is a little trendy relative the last two or three years. Is there any scientific proof that intermittent fasting helps enhance health and longevity? Yeah, it's based on a lot of science. If there was wow. one thing I could recommend, it would be eat less often. This is based on a lot of research, both in animals and in humans. Now we don't have the proof that it'll make you live longer, but I think the evidence is certainly in favor that it will. Um, I do that 16 hour diet if I can, 16, eight. There are all sorts of variations on the theme. You can have very small meals. You can skip um, meals for twice or two days a week. That's called the five plus two diet. Um, and there are other variations like uh, three days every few weeks. So what's going on when we do that is a few things. First of all, these defenses that I've talked about, these sirtuins and your NAD levels will go up. That's all good, right? You'll, you'll have defenses, but you also bring down your blood sugar levels and your blood sugar levels are the best predictor of long, your longevity as part, in terms of blood testing. 
Um, and so all of that combines to the idea that uh, being hungry, being in a state of want for some part of the day will give you the best chance of longevity. Uh, related to what you just said, and you also hinted at it earlier, what would potentially be recommended blood markers in the blood test or urine test that people should take? And should it be every quarter, twice a year, or once a year? Well, uh, I think our, our children are going to laugh at the fact that we go for an annual physical. Um, hopefully, we're going to move away from that because I think we all we want as much data as we can get, as much as we can afford. Um, and for most of us on this call, you know, we're, we're very lucky that we can measure a lot of things. We talk about biometrics. We can do the Apple Watch or whatever watch you want. We've got the rings, but we also have the ability to do blood tests. So in blood, I measure about 35 markers every few months or so with a company and in full disclosure, I, I do have a small investment in this company. Uh, it's called Inside Tracker. Uh, it started about 12 years ago and they have hundreds of thousands of data points on 35 markers that tell you what your optimal range for you and your demographic is, not what a doctor says the average human should be. Um, and I find that very useful and I can see things changing over time as I get older and I bring those back with recommendations they give. Um, but it's important to measure these. So the, it's glucose is the most important. Um, in men, testosterone is, is an indicator of longevity. Uh, inflammation, very important. So TNF-alpha, um, this high sensitivity CRP, C-reactive protein is very important to know about. And then the usual things that we measure anyway, um, lip, Lipids, you don't want a lot of free fatty acids in your blood. You don't want high LDL cholesterol. You want your ratio to be as close to even as possible with HDL, which I actually have now achieved. Um, all of those things come together. Your liver function test is very important. You don't want your liver to be malfunctioning. That's also an indicator that your body is aging rapidly. Uh, you did mention something on testosterone that I'd like to ask you about. Uh, uh, yes, it's going to be dedicated to our male audience here, but as we age, our testosterone decreases uh, more than potentially muscle mass, our libido, our vibrancy, our potential mental acuity as we age, and the loss of muscle mass, especially for men over 60 or 70. Logically, it would appear if our free and other measurements of testosterone are decreasing as we get older, Shouldn't we take testosterone supplementation? But I know that you're a little bit of maybe not. Well, the, the reason is that there have been a lot of studies on testosterone and health in old age. Um, and there, there isn't any evidence that your longevity will be increased by testosterone. Now, what will happen is you'll, uh, for men, uh, you'll get more muscles if you work out with testosterone you'll slow down your loss of muscle mass which is a uh, percent or two per year as you get older i'm 50 now so i, I know how that feels um, the reason that i'm not a big fan of long-term testosterone supplementation um, is partly because it hasn't been shown to extend lifespan but more importantly testosterone is a signal to the body that times are good times are uh, it's time to grow instead of hunker down and survive. And I do worry that if we artificially boost the levels of testosterone, then it's going to counteract those longevity mechanisms. But I'm not completely down on it. You know, I think it's, it's not going to hurt if you take testosterone and build up your muscle. That's all good. I mean, if you fall over when you're 90, that's, you're basically done for. And if you have muscles and you've exercised and stretched, then that can save your life. So testosterone has its place. But what I like to do is, and what, what's working for me tremendously, um, is working out, going to the gym, lifting very heavy weights, using the big muscles in my body, my hips, my legs, and my testosterone has doubled over the last few months because of it. And that's naturally produced testosterone. How do you feel about HGH? Um, I don't feel strongly either way. Again, it's Short-term benefits, you can see those. Long-term, I don't think that's going to be the way to go. Again, because the growth hormone is telling the body 
that you're getting a lot of nutrients, time to grow. Whereas we know that true longevity in old age is the opposite signal. I would have liked to have spent time. I'm sure we're going to get some feedback. Angelo, you didn't really talk too much about mitigating stress, meditation, yoga. All I'm sure are wonderful things. But I think in the remaining approximately 15 minutes that we have, we do have something else that is relatively timely to the audience around the world right now, and that's COVID-19. Uh, from your deep scientific research, and I know we're going to cover a couple of key points of COVID-19 in a very limited window. I get it. Uh, but what do we really know about COVID-19? What are we learning? And I'm assuming that we're learning and globally collaborating every day. We are. And, and so people may look at this and say, well, this, this guy studies aging. What's he talking about COVID-19 for? Um, just a few bits of information that might answer that. Um, I study human aging, which is important here. Um, I've started a vaccine company, um, which Bill, Bill Gates invested in. It's a public company. So I've got that experience. I've got a DNA testing company that tests for COVID-19 genetic material. Um, and I, I, I'm a gatherer of information. I read a lot uh, and try to synthesize things. So there's all that. So I feel somewhat able to speak on this topic, though I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD. Uh, so what am I seeing? Well, let, let's talk about the biology. Uh, we're now learning that in the body, what happens is that the young people are very able to um, to keep the, the numbers of the virus down, but old people are not. And there's a number of differences between young and old bodies. There are changes in the T cells um, in diversity. So young people have lots of different types of T cells. Old people don't. They have this underlying level of inflammation that we've talked about that old, old people don't benefit from. They have less NAD in defenses, and that actually also leads to problems. Uh, they have a dysregulated renin, renin angiotensin system, which uh, you may know is modulated by the ACE2 system and blood pressure drugs. That's dysregulated. There's changes to what our body adds to the surface of proteins in terms of sugar. So proteins in the body have sugar attached, including the ACE2 receptor on our cells and the spike protein on the virus. Um, there's also changes in biological age, which we can now measure. Um, we know exactly how old people are based on biology, not just birthday candles. Um, and they also, their cells also senesce so that part of the body becomes more zombie-like, and that's certainly not helpful either. But overall, what happens is that these viruses become so numerous, and then the, the dead viruses release their contents, is that the body overreacts in the elderly. You get inflammation of the, of the veins in the body, the very small capillaries or capillaries. And this ends up, in many cases, blocking the blood flow in the body, not just in the lungs, but in the heart, in the kidneys, in the brain. Um, and trying to stop that's very, very difficult um, because it's just once the body starts getting clogged up, it can't get oxygen it, and you can't easily release those clots from the body without um, causing some damage. So one of the things I'm involved with is trying to raise the NAD levels in patients so that we can overcome a lot of those problems and uh, shut down that hyperinflammation. So you certainly explain the challenges in COVID-19 that people over 60 or a compromised immune systems, heart issues, diabetes. And you mentioned earlier when talking about longevity, which we didn't do as deep of a dive as I would like, but limited on time, the real important marker of blood sugar uh, and what we take in as sugars, as carbohydrates, and a potential challenge that gives us in terms of raising that blood sugar and the impact that has potentially on inflammation uh, and obviously on the potential of pre-diabetes. Okay, you laid a bit of a foundation from a scientific perspective. What can we do to protect ourselves? Is it simply enhancing our immune system if we're obese, which 40% of Americans are, they're likely gonna have heart issues, they're gonna have diabetes. Is and as simple as being in better shape. Well, yeah, it is. It is. If, if you are obese, there are two problems that have happened to you. One is that you've had a high level of blood sugar in your body because you're overeating. Um, and high blood sugar, as we've said, is, is really bad. There was a paper that just came out a couple of days ago uh, in uh, the EMBO journal, if you want to look it up, EMBO. 
that showed actually that high blood sugar levels leads to increased DNA damage, which as I've explained, uh, is part of the aging process that leads to the loss of information and cells lose their identity. So all of this is coming together in the information theory of aging, that by overeating, we're causing DNA damage and scratching up our DVDs. But also what's happening is when you become obese, your fat cells will start to naturally secrete inflammatory molecules and the overall inflammation in your body will go up and up and up. And we know that chronic inflammation also accelerates the aging process. Uh, and in terms of from, and I know you want to be careful, again, we're not giving medical advice. I'm not an MD, you're not an MD. But in terms of the scientific research relative to immunity, broadly speaking, uh, having, and this is where blood workups could certainly help, but you mentioned vitamin D. There's been some talk about certain forms of and high enough doses in some trials of vitamin C. What are you reading? Well, uh, so I've started taking vitamin C, uh, liposomal um, vitamin That's C. That's it, yes. <laughs> and yeah. if you don't mind, uh, what dosage? Uh, I'd have to run to my bathroom, but it's a, it's a hefty capsule. Uh, I'm guessing it, that it's 500 milligrams. Yeah, but some people take much more. You can go to a gram, some people even higher. But I, I don't go high because it's been shown time and time again that high levels of this and other antioxidants can actually cause more damage, um, including DNA damage, which of course we don't want. So yeah, I'm taking uh, a moderate level of vitamin C every morning. So you mentioned things like managing weight, uh, caloric restriction, broadly being in good health with your immunity through exercise, possibly cold water plunges if your heart could take it, and so on us. And you know, vitamin D, possibly vitamin C, uh, quartin, I believe, is another one that we're hearing of from an immunity perspective. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Resveratrol, which you spoke about, NAD, which you were, you know, that was one of the ones you were really, that's, that's kind of be on the forefront of what's going on. What are your thoughts on the future state of probably not just this pandemic and how it might play out, but I'm assuming in the future, whether it's one year or a hundred years, hopefully closer to a hundred years, uh, that we're going to have other challenges like this as well. But I'm assuming we're also going to have such advancements in, bi in biotech and technology and vaccine uh, that treatments in the future may be much, much quicker. Well, let's hope so. Uh, it's been very disappointing, uh, the lack of progress here um, and across the planet, uh, including the test that didn't work for the first six weeks here. Um, Angela, if you, if you just let me say something, going back and I'll come back here, is that you mentioned quercetin, quercetin uh, is yes. how it's pronounced, yep. Um, we've mentioned olive oil, which has oleic acid. We've mentioned resveratrol. There's another one called physetin, which uh, is anti-cell uh, senescence. All of these molecules actually bind to the SIRT1 enzyme, the Pac-Man. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think this is telling us that turning on these sirtuins is the way to go in our diet. Um, anyway, getting back to, to COVID-19, yeah, we're going to be a very different world. There's going to be a lot more investment, uh, both by the government and the private sector in biotech because of this. Like you say, if you don't have your health, what's the point of everything else? Um, and so the, we're also seeing scientists come together across the world, scientists that used to be at each other's throats are uh, being more collaborative and trying to solve this. I mean, humanity has never come together ever, as far as I know, against one enemy. So I'm really optimistic that this shock to the system, and let, let's face it, this is not the worst it can be. And maybe in our lifetimes, we'll see something much worse with a death rate of 10%. We need to be ready for that. But we're gonna have much quicker vaccines next time, much better tests, including hopefully the one that uh, I'm developing today, um, and be ready for when this comes again. We're going to get to biotech and spend a couple of minutes on that as we wrap up. Uh, it's probably putting you in a bit of a tough spot, but obviously people that potentially are over 60, those that are obese, those that have challenges with their heart or diabetes or are immune compromised, cancer treatments, whatever, should be incredibly careful because the death rate for them is a lot higher 
uh, than it is for everyone else. You could argue they, to protect their health, they really need to be quarantined. Would you almost say that for all others, uh, are we being too rigid and careful in our policies or is this needed? What are other countries doing? I know one of the Scandinavian countries is taking a little bit more of an open approach, but I don't know the results of that. It's putting you in a tough spot, but if you could <laughs> summarize what you're seeing in the research, that would be great. Sure. Well, if I'm just talking about the data and interpreting it, it's never a tough spot. That's the easy part of my job. I have no agenda. Um, so Sweden isn't doing as well as we hoped. Um, I mean, it's not the end of Sweden, but I believe the number of deaths uh, is far higher in Sweden than in other countries. But the question is, in the long run, is it going to be different? We don't know yet. But I think the best analogy to make here is that we, had a we have a Band-Aid over a wound, and some countries uh, ripped it off, meaning that they took very strong measures against the virus, shut down everything. You cannot gather more than two people. You can't even go out your front door. That was China. That was Australia. And we saw that within two months, they went down to nearly zero cases. That's ripping the Band-Aid off quickly. Okay, But that's not how we like to live in the US, right? And even no matter what the government says, there's going to be the screw you attitude for, of some people. Um, and we're seeing the consequences of that. We're slowly peeling off the Band-Aid and it's hurting and it's going to be a lot, of, lot more pain for longer. Um, and and that's, that's the issue. You know, I would have loved if we could have been more rigid and we'd be done with this already, like Australia is, or at least getting back to work in the next few weeks. But unfortunately, at least in large centers, uh, you know, New York, Boston, where I'm at, uh, we're not going to be going back to work anytime soon. And I think largely, I don't just think, it's, it's, it's self-evident that it's because people uh, didn't obey the recommendations of the government and we're going to have to drag this out for another month at least. Um, but I would love to go back to work. I think we all would, you know, especially people who lost their jobs. They're freaking out. Uh, we had Elon Musk today say, free America. Uh, but I think that for most cities where this is, the cases are still high, that's bad advice, unfortunately. The vaccines, and there's dozens, if not hundreds of companies globally, to some degree globally co cooperating. You know, the belief is, if we listen to Dr. Fauci and others, and this would still be quick, I get it, 12 to 18 months, 12 to 18 months. My, my instinct would be, political pressures uh, and a variety of reasons. There's gonna be companies that are gonna hopefully pop something that works sooner than that. And I guess we're getting some good news out of, what is it, Gilead with their Remvestor, although that's more for a treatment than a vaccine. Uh, again, I know you're gonna only be on the data, but from what you're seeing so far, do you think we'll actually have something within six months that will be a vaccine? No, unfortunately. Um, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, uh, and I always think that humans can solve anything if they put their mind to it, which we are doing with lots of money thrown at it. Uh, but it, wouldn't, it won't be by the beginning of this year, or the, sorry, the end of this year or at the beginning of next. Now, what we should have, if we're lucky, is that uh, companies like Moderna, who is leading the charge here in Massachusetts, they have new technology that the CEO says, um, you know, and I have some insights into what they're saying behind the scene, is that this will at least be shown to work or not by the end of the year, and hopefully rolled out fairly soon thereafter. But the pessimist in me says, first of all, we've never made a, a successful vaccine against the common cold, and coronaviruses are common colds. So that's a challenge. But even if, if we develop a vaccine that sh shows that it works in nurses and doctors, this, that's still a long way from rolling it out to billions of people. First of all, coronavirus vaccines have been shown in monkeys to make things worse on occasion. And we don't want to vaccinate billions of people and make things worse. That would be clearly throwing fuel on the fire. So we need to do a lot of safety testing and lots of people and the government here will not roll out vaccines until they're absolutely proven to be safe. And the second issue uh, is that if there's logistics. Ramping up vaccines isn't easy. Um, and Bill Gates, you know, bless his heart, has done a lot of, you know, philanthropy. And I'm sure there are people here listening who have helped 
And I'm very grateful, we should all be grateful for getting us ready to ramp up vaccines. But it's not gonna be overnight. It's gonna take many months to do that. And then look globally, how hard was it to wipe out or try to wipe out smallpox? You can't go to every place on the earth easily and vaccinate people. It's hard. It's going to take you know, hundreds of thousands of people on the, on the street, on the ground, to vaccinate people. Now, we don't have to reach everybody, but we do have to reach some sort of herd immunity, which is at least 50% of the planet. Um, and even then, the virus is going to be in cats. It's going to be in minks. It might still you know, be in our environment. It might be in remote villages. And the concern is that it's going to keep coming back like the common cold every year. And let's hope that's not the case, but that is one scary scenario. One more question, then we'll segue over to biotech. Uh, is there a belief in what are we seeing in the data in the Southern and Northern Hemisphere? Will the advent of warmer weather and humidity, similar to, I guess, cold and flus, inherently cause a significant reduction in COVID-19 this summer? Yeah. Well, the information that's coming out is always confusing. Um, you know, don't wear masks, definitely wear masks. Heat matters. No, it doesn't. I've been consistent. Masks help and temperature helps and humidity helps. Um, and I've looked at all the data across the planet for viruses, including COVID-19. So my conclusions are that it doesn't stop the virus, doesn't mean that it'll go away over summer. That's not the point, but it will make things easier. Um, the, the statistics are, for example, that for every degree Celsius that the temperature increases, the R naught of the disease goes down by 0.1, which is very helpful, right? We need to sure. Um, humidity is very good, actually. It's not known why humidity helps, interestingly, but if you put animals or even school children in high humidity, um, around 45, 50%, they don't catch viruses that easily. And I've written about this. It may be because the lung mucus is actually thicker when we have more humidity and the virus just can't get access to our cells. There was one question that came in from the chat feature. Uh, in May of 2019, there was a Scientific American article suggesting that a higher risk of cancer for individuals who take NAD supplements. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Uh, yeah, um, people who write that don't read the papers. Um, I think everybody should who can, who wants to write about it. The fact is that uh, that study showed that if you decrease the amount of NAD in cancer cells of mouse, in the mouse brain, the cancers don't grow as quickly. Um, but that makes sense, right? If you knock out the cell's ability to make energy and carry out chemical reactions, of course those cells will grow slowly. Uh, it's like, you know, disabling a cell. Now the, the PR department at the university wrote a press release um, that said, well, that means that if you raise NAD, the cancer cells are gonna spread and grow more, which wasn't tested. Um, and it's also bad science, that's not true. Um, now it's possible, but I'm just saying you can't conclude that based on the evidence that was shown. Um, so we've also done a fair amount of work in mice, admittedly, for liver cancer um, and for breast cancer. And in no case have we seen an increase in the tumor size or the number of tumors. Doesn't mean it's risk-free, of course, because we haven't done a lot of human studies. We've only done two years of testing in older but healthy individuals. But I haven't seen anything in scientific debt literature or in the trials that I'm aware of, um, and I'm very close to some of them, that makes me worried about cancer at this point. But again, it doesn't mean that it's risk-free. Uh, given I know you have a tight time schedule, we only have a couple of minutes left, and I do want to have an opportunity for families and others listening in that may want to learn more to be supportive of your initiatives, as well as potentially are interested from a biotech perspective it's impossible, David, but in three minutes before we get to the close, give us a little bit of color of what you're doing from a biotech perspective and potentially the value that is to society and how families of wealth and investors could learn more about it. Okay. Uh, so I work on various levels um, and certainly feel free to reach out to me. Um, Angelo will have my email if, if you need it. But I work on various levels. Um, I'm a problem solver for the planet. 
And I bring together teams of hundreds of people of the best in the world to solve hard problems. Part of the problem solving is to revolutionize microbiology. Instead of growing things on petri dishes like the 19th century, we're doing DNA testing and finding everything that's in the human body that's not human. That's, ready, that's already being rolled out. That's a commercial entity. I'm working on pharmaceuticals to reverse aging um, and boost the body's ability to be young again. I have uh, one of the companies is an NAD boosting company that's running clinical trials right now. Um, I have a company that um, is reversing aging. We have a, a gene therapy that's able to restore eyesight in mice that have lost their vision through glaucoma or just simply old age. So we can actually reset the epigenetic clock. In other words, polish the CD. Um, I work with biosecurity. We, we're looking at ways to kill the virus and protect us and monitor the world for new viruses. Um, so I'm doing all of that. Um, and you know, it's too much to talk about, but you can certainly learn more by um, contacting me directly and I'd be happy to tell you more. Correct. And broadly speaking, is there a website uh, and the name of your book where people could simply learn more prior to reaching out? Uh, absolutely. So my book is called Lifespan. Uh, it became a New York Times bestseller, much to my surprise. And it talks about why we age, uh, why we don't have to, how to polish that DVD, and things you can do in your own life to slow the aging process and even hopefully reverse some parts of it. Um, and I also talk about the coming pandemic, interestingly, because I knew that that was coming. And I talk about what, what we need to do to boost the body's defenses against that using the same technology in the aging field. Um, I have a, a newsletter that I encourage you to sign up for because I'm talking a lot about COVID-19 and things that you won't hear in the media. Um, you'll only learn if you read scientific papers like I do every day that are coming out. And that can be found at my website, which is called lifespanbook.com, lifespanbook.com. Um, also, if you send your email to, uh, to Angelo, I'm sure he can have you signed up for the newsletter um, as well. Yeah, that newsletter. newsletter. Sorry, I just forgot to mention. There's tens of thousands of people who get this newsletter from me every 10 days or so, but I have a VIP version that uh, folks listening um, should be able to get, which is a little bit more personal as well. And David, and I'm hopefully I have her name right, but the assistant that helped to put us together, or the associate, Stephanie, was that her name? Uh, Susan DeStefano. Susan. Would it be better to make a direct connection to her to save your inbox or? <laughs> Um, well, I'm pretty good with emails, but yeah, she might be the, the best person to uh, organize a, a meeting. Um, I'm certainly uh, I'm incapable of dealing with my calendar at this point. But yeah, if you can see uh, her at least, that would be great. Of course, of course. Uh, I am going to now do my close. It'll take about a minute, 90 seconds, and then we're done. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles of Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast. And the founder and CEO of Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to the interest of highly successful families and their single family offices. We do proprietary content, we host global programming, that's a little bit on hold now, but in lieu of that, we're doing daily, that's daily online meetings with great guests like David and many, many others that we've had over the last month, including peer-to-peer, we're directly facilitating conversations with families and developing a series of master classes and mastermind groups for our members and our relationships. It's been an incredibly active time for us. And we hope if you're not a member, you have a chance to reach out and learn more. I'm incredibly active on social media, Family Office Association on Instagram, very active on LinkedIn, my YouTube channel, and we will have a video within two or three days of this interview up. It simply is family office, so it's easy to find in terms of the channel on YouTube. And I could be reached at familyofficeassociation.com, angelorobles.com, and likely preferred email, angelo at familyofficeassociation.com. David Sinclair, thank you so much for being our special guest today. It was incredibly insightful and look forward to next time. Thank you, Angelo. It's been great. Thank you.